Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another top five here on the Badger Listens channel. Um, yeah, I uh, had a rough day today. I was betrayed by someone who was supposed to have my back. And uh, it doesn't feel good, never feels good. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, people have been on my case about things that they should have known by now. Anyway, regardless, I'm not going to go into details. I'm through talking about it. But let's just say I had a rough day. And that just got me thinking about what I like to listen to musically. Because music, the beauty of it is that it can be there for you when you've had a rough day. It can be there to celebrate in the good times. It could be there to get you through the bad times. It could be there to create memories. It could be there to recall memories. Um, it's the closest thing to magic that we have in this world. And so, you know, here I am at the end of my very own rough day, not the first in my life, certainly won't be the last. And, you know, why not sprinkle a little magic dust on it? Why not uh, talk about some albums that uh, help get me through? Here's the concept. So, basically, it's one of two categories. Either it, it, we're talking about albums that calm and soothe and help me feel generally less sad, angry, frustrated, or whatever other negative feelings I got going on. Or, alternately, and both of these things, I'm telling you, sometimes you, you want the feelings to go away, and sometimes you're like, no, I'm going to go through this. <laughs> like, the only way round is through. And so, like, I'm going to let me feel my emotions and, like, go through this and work my way through it until I come out the other side. Um, and so, yeah, albums that fit in one or both of those categories. Um, as always, feel free to let me know how you feel about my picks and uh, let me know what you would add to your own list. You know, what, what are your top five uh, helping you get through a rough day albums? Anyway, uh, here are some honorable mentions. This one's fairly recent. Um, YouTube introduced me to this one. Uh, I didn't know Pine Grove at all. Uh, they are a band camp band. Uh, they're kind of an indie, uh, folksy-ish, singery, songwritery, uh, yeah, kind of groovy Americana type feeling with an indie vibe. Um, but like with really strong choruses and like really solid, solid lyrics. Um, surprisingly good band. Uh, yeah, surprised that they don't make more waves in this world because they have like... I don't know, six albums out, something like that, not to mention their EPs and whatnot. And uh, this one comes with, like, if you choose to listen to this album, here's what I recommend. Go on YouTube and just search for this album. They made a film that's kind of ridiculous and kind of funny, uh, but also, like, really interesting, and it's a good introduction to the band you know this little weird indie film project thing that sort of uh i don't know it's hard to describe you just kind of need to see it and uh yeah it's good stuff i enjoy me some pine grove i now have all of their albums thanks Bandcamp. and uh yeah really enjoy listening to these guys Sorry they didn't make it higher on the list. It's only top five, so what are you going to do? Uh, yeah, can't believe this one gets an honorable mention instead of a listing because, like, this is a classic. 
um, Neko Case, Fox Confessor Brings the Flood. I mean, any Neko Case, that woman's voice just, like, it, it penetrates, you know? Uh, like, there's just some people's voices that just cut through the noise and uh, really bring something that nobody else can bring. And this woman, like, if you've heard her with new pornographers, if you have heard her in her solo stuff, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, she's a fantastic singer-songwriter, amazing vocalist, and um, just brings a vibe that nobody else has. Nobody, nobody has the Neko Case vibe. Uh, that is just a simple fact. And this album, top to bottom, is probably my favorite Neko Case album. It's also the first one of hers that I ever heard. So this kind of a nostalgic connection to a time and a place when I was discovering music like this. So, you know, it, it does take me back in a really, really nice way. Uh, another honorable mention, oh my god, saves the day, stay what you are. Uh, remember when emo was not like, uh, pop punk with a bad haircut and some hot topic pants? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> there was a time when emo was like a legit emerging genre, and there was some work being done in the genre that was like legitimately interesting and this album is you know uh one of the highlights of that i mean you've got like uh captain jazz's only album you've got uh get up kids something to write home about i mean obviously weezer's pinkerton started the whole thing and then saves the day stay what you are those are my you know albums for if you want to know what emo was kind of going to be and also could have been but like didn't turn into that unfortunately uh this album musically lyrically is so like uh i don't know it's so lyrically open and earnest that it's almost like it verges on cheesy uh, but never ever steps over that line, not once. Like it's, it's right up to the line, never over. And and so like it's an earnestness and an honest openness that like, um, if you ain't ready for, if you ain't in the mood for that kind of thing, like just back off and maybe uh, hold off on listening to this one until you're in a place where you can handle that kind of business. Um, because yeah, this is musical earnestness. This is musical, emotional honesty, um, on an impressive level. And I love this album. I saw them live, uh, when they were touring for this album. And so there's also that, you know, like sometimes, cause I saw them live um, they were actually opening up for another band that, that I'm a big fan of, uh, Ash, if you know Ash, from the, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a bunch of, um, well, they used to be teenagers, uh, <laughs> they're my age, they're like, yeah, getting older, um, but anyway, you know, they started out as these brash young teenagers uh, from the UK and, um, you know, have morphed into this amazing, incredible band that never gets the kind of love they deserve, at least not stateside, at least not in the United States. Anyway, Saves the Day opened for them, which is interesting because I only know about Ash because they opened for Weezer on the Pinkerton tour, so... <laughs> It's a circle of life. Um, but yeah, I saw these guys and I was like, I have to know more about them. And I have to get some of their stuff. And so I bought this album and yeah, blew me away. Big fan ever since. Um, yeah, this one. Oh my God. Remember? <laughs> okay. 
uh, not a Surf's first album when it came out. I think it's called High Low. Uh, it's the one with the kid riding a bike. Um, anyway, the uh, that album had the song Popular, which made everybody think that not a Surf was like trying to be Weezer, you know, because everybody equated that song with the sweater song which like was also a bit of a curse for Weezer because everybody was like, oh, these gimmick bands. Because also like earlier in the 90s, you had like, you know, uh, Green Jello and uh, Ugly Kid Joe and like these legitimately gimmicky gimmick bands that like had one hit and then they would fade away into obscurity. But like, you know, uh, people were thinking this was a new type of 90s gimmick. Uh, but that was never who Not A Surf was. Like, people just did not get it. And it's funny, because I am a huge Weezer fan. Obviously, they are my number one favorite band of all time. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. I know people have a lot of feelings about that. Um... And I, I take a lot of crap for that from a lot of people. Uh, whatever. I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I you know. Uh, but yeah, Not A Surf. Like, I admittedly listened to their first album because I was like looking for more things like Weezer. And Ozma hadn't happened yet. And <laughs> because Ozma is like Weezer 2. Um now with keyboards anyway uh but yeah not a surf is very much its own thing and they are brilliant indie songwriters and this album in particular is so good top to bottom and uh it is pretty emotionally heavy the weight is a gift i mean the title says everything you want to know um, I can't recommend this one highly enough. If you never made it past popular as far as not a surf is concerned, the weight is a gift. Like, come on, get on board. Um, okay, now we get into the real deal. Here's my number five. And I know it's kind of an obvious choice, but it's obvious for a reason because like it hits a spot and it hits it exactly perfectly look band of horses uh <laughs> cease to begin it is uh like to my mind still their most commercially known album um especially by people who don't really dive deep into the rest of their catalog and I own all the Band of Horses albums, all of them. Whenever they release anything, I'm always like, gotta give me that. Because I just love their sound. I think it's uh, fantastically interesting. Um, you know, they were part of a number of um, really interesting indie folkish kind of uh, artists coming out at the same time, you know, the same time felt like, like, felt like maybe it was just when I was discovering them, but like, you know, when Fleet Foxes was coming out and, and, you know, things of that nature. And I just, this album, you know, more than any of the other things that was happening at that time, this album just penetrated and, so many of these songs just really resonate and have, I mean, the very first song, Is There a Ghost? Like, um, yeah, it just, it hits, like, because you, you know what it is. You know the song. You've heard it a million times. But then you hear it, and you, you hear those doubled up vocals, those, you know, because uh, they... <laughs> I love it when bands figure out like, oh, you do the John Lennon thing. You double up those vocals. John Lennon did it because he hated the sound of his own voice. And you get guys like uh, Nate Ruiz from uh, The Format and Fun. He's an Arizona boy, so kudos to him for making it big. 
uh, and making it big in a good way. I, I know some people won't agree with that, but I, I still enjoy them. Um, yeah, he doubles up his vocals. That's that what gives him his unique vocal sound. And Band of Horses, like, yeah, they double it up. They, they double it up on those uh, lead vocals, and it gives a very, like, you know, hey, this is John Lennon style. And uh, it, like, I don't know, maybe it's because John Lennon did it that it carries a certain emotional gravitas, but yeah. I just can't get enough of it. The songwriting on this album is excellent, top to bottom. Um, yes, some of these songs have been overplayed and, and whatnot. I mean, uh, yeah, like how many weddings did you have to go to after this came out where it's like, oh, what's y'all's song? Nobody's ever going to love you like I do. Okay, okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, all right, well, thanks. Uh, I love your centerfolds that are a mason jar full of local rocks and stuff, like, wrapped in burlap. Like, we get it. You guys are, like, totally awesome and with it. Yeah, congratulations on your marriage. If I just described your wedding, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, there was a certain sweet spot where that was just the vibe like, oh, would you do have it in a backyard and like had mason jar centerpieces and had like, you know, those lights that look like old timey lights, uh, you know, uh, just white lights dangling from trees and stuff. Sorry, sorry that I perfectly described some of your weddings, but like. Congratulations on having a solid Band of Horses song as your song. Um, so, yeah, good on you. Uh, number four. This one is one, like, you want to talk about, like, complicated feelings and, like, both working your way through them and feeling them, but also, like, soothing and calming at the same time. Mac Miller, like the chillest rapper that has ever been or will ever be uh you know just an all-timer and i love his vibe i love everything about him is so sad because if you know your mac miller history you know that this album uh he went and he hung out with rick rubin at shangri-la because he was trying to get clean uh, because he struggled with addiction problems his, his whole life, and that's what took him out in the end. Very sad. But, um, and, and also, if you know your Mac Miller, you know that there were two albums that he released at the end. This one, uh, was released right before he died, and then, uh, Circles was released after he died he was working on that one right up until the end and so swimming in circles is the whole vibe there but also it kind of describes his circular relationship with his own addiction with his own demons with his own problems and so like once again you you want emotional honesty this guy right here um and also like uh, what a unique, unique man. Like, nobody sounds like him. Nobody. Nobody did. Nobody could. He's one of a kind. And this album, like, yeah, I know Circles. Like, some people prefer Circles. Some people f prefer Swimming. I'm in the Swimming camp. Sorry. Apologies to my Circles people. Uh, but yeah, I just, I love this album top to bottom and I love its vibe. And I also on a rough day, you know, when I've got things to work through, this is a good one for me personally. It, it hits a nice sweet spot of like, uh, feeling your feelings, but also like soothing your feelings. So a li little bit of dual action on this one. Uh, number three. Now, you know how a lot of albums, the album art tells you everything you want to know about 
the album. This is not that. You look at this and you're like, okay, Jorma Kalkinen, he was the lead guitarist for uh, Jefferson Airplane. And then right when they started going all Jefferson Starship, he's like, you know what, guys, I'm good. Let's call it a good time with this band. I'm going to go do some solo stuff. I'm just going to, you know, go pick my guitar. Uh, going to do some stuff with Tim Hobson and like do some stuff. Just me. We're going to, you know, uh, eventually turn into hot tuna. <laughs> like, uh, which I know someone here's like how oddly weird people and their personal musical tastes are a lot of people don't even know hot tuna and don't really care about hot tuna i know a guy who freaking hates hot tuna and if you play hot tuna he will leave the room <laughs> like how wildly specific is that it is different strokes for all the different folks there's no getting around it Anyways, so Jorma Kalkin in his first solo album that he cut post Jefferson Airplane. And it is him and an acoustic guitar just picking and singing. It's, uh, you know, it, there's some Dylan esque moments, but there's also some like Chet Atkins feels to it in places. And there's some like jazzy kind of bits and there's some like it's just he's a really good guitarist and also like you can tell he's going for a feeling on this album and he nails it like okay so he wrote I think it's split first half and second half I think he Yorma Kalkinen wrote the first half and Tim Hobson wrote the back half front half of this album is way better than the back half um, but still, I, I listen to the whole thing. It, it's solidly good. I really love it. Um, but I'm telling you, you look at this cover art and you're like, oh, this is going to be the most mind melty, psychedelic, trippy experience of my entire life. No, it's not. It's like some mellow, mellow ass acoustic guitar picking and singing and stuff. It's very laid back. It's very uh, stripped down. Only like the bare necessities of instrumentation and vocals are here on this album. And it's really, really well done. I love this album. I listen to it all the time. I get people to buy it whenever I can because this album you can pick up most places. You can find it anywhere. You've probably seen this album cover and we're like, ugh. Like, I don't want that. That doesn't look like a record that I want in my collection. Um, but yeah, if you like, uh, like if you like Bob Dylan, okay, we'll put it that way. If you like, you know, guitar picking type folksy kind of stuff, this album, so good. So, so good. And some of the songs on here, just, I, I can't even, um, like, hold up. I, I'm going I'm to have to pull this up so that I can, uh, you know, uh, be able to talk uh, talk on it specifically. Uh, f yeah. So, uh, first song on the album, Genesis. Really, really good. Second song, uh, I'll Be Alright. Oh, my God. That song picks me up when I'm down. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Song for the North Star. Uh, really, really good. Oh my God. Uh, one of my favorite songs on here is I Am The Light Of This World. What an amazing song. And I just, top to bottom, this album uh, picks me up, picks me up so, so well. And I love that like, I, I just... I kept seeing this in my record store and I was like, what is this? What even is this? And so I wrote down the name and then I went and Googled it at work. And then after work, I went back to the record store and picked it up because, 
you know, all music or wherever I went, Discogs or whoever I went to look at it, told me like, oh, this is a solid album. And so I picked it up. I have not regretted it. I highly recommend this one. All right. Now we're getting into some rarefied air, people. Number two and number one, all that are left. Number two, and this uh, this used to be my number one for the longest time. I used to just, in college, lie face down and just cry while I listened to Side B especially of this album. First of all, the band is very special to me. I love them. I love, love, love the band. Uh, they just, nobody is like them. Nobody is like them. I know there are a lot of bands out there that are rootsy. Nobody is as rootsy as the band. I know there are bands out there who are like, um, you know, multi-instrumentalists and people who can just pick up anything and play it. Not like the band. Not like the band was. There's never been a group of musicians as talented as these guys. Like, look, let me put it to you this way. Robbie Robertson, who, like, solid dude. Uh, I'm not going to knock Robbie Robertson. But, like, he's the least interesting member of the band. He's the lead singer and lead guitar. Well, lead guitarist. Lead singer is not even a concept that applies to the band. It's like... Wh whoever, whichever, you know, you get Rick Danko singing some songs, you get Richard Manuel singing songs, you get like every everybody uh, that wants to gets a turn, uh, you know, you get Levon Helm singing songs, uh, and he's the freaking drummer, you know, and he's great. Uh, there's a really good documentary, um, Levon Helm, uh, like I forget what it's called. It's on Netflix. It's from the last years of his life when he was going out on the tour and he was playing these uh, Hootenanny shows um, where he would just get like local musicians wherever he was, he'd get people together and they would just play old band songs and LeVon Helm songs and other songs like from his repertoire. And yeah, it, it was incredible, those shows, but more than anything, it was so tragic because he wouldn't have been doing it in the failing health that he had if, um, you know, if his fortunes hadn't been, you know, uh, like melted away by that point uh, through, you know, happens to a lot of people, like hard to hold on to money. You know, it just is. And so, like, you see him as an old man just trying to hang on and just trying to, you know, keep himself alive by still making his music. And as he goes out in the world, what he finds is just love, just all love. The, the number, like, if you don't listen to the band, just know this, that your favorite band loves the band. Like... <laughs> That's just a fact about the world. And if your favorite band doesn't love the band, then your favorite band isn't very good. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just make wild proclamations. No. Um, but yeah, the, come on. The band is the band that Bob Dylan chose. Uh, you know, like, the band, it, like, the, the last waltz my dudes like go go watch that is like the greatest concert film ever freaking coppola uh <laughs> coppola made that one and yes i know all the history about like the re-recordings and whatnot and i know that emmy lou harris's track was not performed live and all of that still i don't care it's the best one um but yeah, uh, music from Big Pink is the band's debut album, and uh, it just hits a special spot. And I, I'm sad that it's been unseated, but it has been by <laughs> this, The Flaming Lips, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. And it kind of drives me crazy that this is my number one, 
Like, admittedly, I don't love that this is my number one, just because it seems like a really obvious choice. Oh, what's your favorite Help You Feel Better album? Oh, it's just the most commercially successful of all the Flaming Lips albums. <laughs> like, it's the one where people who aren't really Flaming Lips fans know. Yeah, sorry. But, like, understand this. Let me just tell you the story of its intersection with my life and you'll understand why. And, and I myself doubted the power of this album to help me feel the way that I need to feel when getting through hard times um, and getting through a rough day. But, like, he here's what it legitimately was. When I first moved to Tempe... I was looking to transfer. I start. I had started out at a community college in a tiny little town, and then I uh, went big time. I moved to the big city, Tempe, Arizona, and um, I wanted to go to ASU, but there was no way that I could afford it unless I got a job. Like I had scholarships and stuff, but they wouldn't pay for me to live. They would just pay for me to go to school. And I needed a job and no one, no one was hiring. Um, like it was a rough time to be trying to find a job. And like the beautiful thing about ASU at the time was they had a record store in the student union. Uh, it's called Hoodlums Music and they're the best. And I owe so much to those guys. Uh, they literally gave me an education in music that is invaluable. I th There are albums that I kid you not, I walked in and they're like, you have to buy this. The, you are taking this with you. I'm sorry, you are buying this album. Um, <laughs> which like is kind of a cool thing for a store to do when they've figured you out well enough. But I, I hung out there so often they offered me a job more than once and I turned them down. And the only reason I turned them down is because I knew if I worked there and they didn't offer me a job like when I was looking for a job, <laughs> they offered because they were all staffed up at the time. They offered me a job when I hung out there so much that I basically was staff. Like I was helping customers <laughs> and stuff. I was helping people find stuff. I was making album recommendations. And Steve, the guy who uh, owned, Hood well, one of the owners of Hoodlums was like, why don't you just work here? And I was like, uh, because I would be cashing my paychecks out the till because there would be no like uh, take home pay for me because I would spend it all on music. I was like, I would love to. I would absolutely love to, but I can't. Like, do you understand? Like, I already spent as, like, I spent so much money on music in college. Like, I didn't have to eat ramen. I chose to eat ramen so that I could spend everything else on music. <laughs> like, I was that hungry for it. And that's why when people see my collection today, they're like, oh my God, your collection's amazing. How do you get such an amazing collection? It's like, yeah, well, um, I starved myself in college <laughs> and then I never sold anything back ever. There you go. Step one, step two. Step one, starve yourself. Spend all the rest of your money on music. Step two, never, ever, ever sell any of your music back ever for any reason. Except for that one album by The Coral. I freaking hate that album. <laughs> anyway, regardless... But here, here's why I bring up Hoodlums and all of that. This album was on a listening post at Hoodlums when I first started going there when I did not have a job. And so all I could do was listen to the albums that they had there. And, the, you know, it, it wasn't like they were listening posts. They weren't like the old school ones where would play 30 seconds of a song. No, these were like CD players uh, that were just built in like somebody had built into a unit and um, you could listen to the whole album. And I did. I listened to this over and over again. 
and I was like so close to having to tuck my tail between my legs and move back in with my parents because I couldn't get a job and um, I almost didn't finish college because I couldn't get a job and I was applying everywhere like I didn't even get a call back when I was applying to be like a bag boy at Safeway it was rough out there and like I just I was at the end of my rope I didn't know what to do and um, then eventually I got hired uh, to be a library assistant and then eventually I became a librarian and then you know did that for you know about a decade or so um, but yeah that the library saved my life that's for sure there's no getting around that but here's the other thing is that when I got that job what did I go buy as soon as I had the ability to buy it I bought this I bought the flaming lips and it's funny because this album was so different from everything else that I was listening to at the time but the quality of this album was absolutely undeniable. You just can't listen to it and be uh, anything but impressed at the absolute quality of the songwriting, of the instrumentation, of the chance-taking, inventiveness, the freaking experimental nature. Like, how about the fact that this album is still as experimental as most other things i won't say everything because there's like there's that album i always forget the name of it where it's four cds and you're supposed to play all four of them at once with four different cd players to get like a weird quadraphonic experience um yeah that album is way more experimental <laughs> but like yoshimi battles the pink robots is just about as experimental and out there as everything else in the Flaming Lips catalog. And it was wildly commercially successful. Like people bought this. And I mean, obviously, uh, Do You Realize was the runaway hit and people loved that. Like, but even though that song got overplayed, it never tainted my love of this album ever i can still listen to it to this day and not be like ugh, this song again like it still hits me in that special special way that it did when i was first listening to it on a listening post and so this album because it was like the one thing that i could listen to when i was like oh my god someday when i have a job I'm gonna get this and then I got it and then I could listen to it because I had a job and I finished my education and my life was just you know set from then on like I I've been okay ever since and you know this album was uh it, it just came along at a time when you know things weren't okay yet but they became okay. And when they became okay, I got this album. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna say for my, uh, my, my top five albums at the end of a rough day. I had a rough day and I really enjoyed going through my library and looking up the albums like what is it that really helps me feel better uh so yeah feel free to tell me uh what you think i missed what you think i got right what you think i got wrong um what are your top five help you feel better after a bad day albums i'm curious to know and yeah thanks everybody if you made it this far on this one i know i can be long-winded but i love talking about music it's just the way I am. Anyway, so if, you, uh, if you've got anything to add, I, I'm not just telling you because, like, comment on my videos so I can monetize. Like, no. No, no, no. I don't care about that at all. All I care about is, like, let's have a conversation about music. 
So uh, tell me what you think. I'd love to hear from you. And thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Okay, bye.